I believe that I've been able to help people break through these beatings and tortures and all that stuff by helping them see things that they didn't see and refuse to see because they never thought to see because of the moral hypocrisies that they were indoctrinated in. Does everything have an upside? Even yeah. the, the worst trauma yes. and torture? Yes, absolutely. Oprah Winfrey was, quote, that way. And she's one of the most powerful women on the planet. So it's not what happens to you, it's what you decide to do with it, how you perceive it. Is poverty a choice? It is to some degree, because it's a choice of whenever you do make anything, how you spend it and distribute it. So Andrew Tate controversially said that um, some women should take some responsibility for being... I've yet to see it that can't be turned into something they can be grateful for and move on. People can be grateful for... Grateful for, for the... Yeah. We only judge in things in other people that represent parts of us we've got buried inside that we're not loving and we're resenting or feeling ashamed of. Where did you want to have sex when they didn't want to? And they go, my boyfriend. And they go and I, they own all these traits. The, the speed in which you see both sides of an event is your wisdom. If you'd like me to have more conversations like this and go deep, make sure you support the channel. Like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. John, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> well, <clears throat> what we make out of it. Each individual, um, based on their needs and voids and their value structure, is going to interpret their reality and give the meaning that they perceive it to be. So I don't know if there's a universal meaning um, other than the integration of all pairs of opposites. That's about the only thing I could say. The mean between those. Aristotle in his time said that there was an excess and deficiency which were both vices and the mean was the mean between the two. So anytime we are excessive and go into pride or deficient go into shame, um, to extract meaning out of those experiences we intuitively ask the question, what are the downsides to when we're up and what are the upsides when we're down and bring ourselves back in the mean and we extract meaning out of our existence. So, but I don't know if there's any universal meaning. As Kemo said, uh, you know, it's a, pointless to search for that, but it's wisdom in looking inside yourself and find out how you perceive each experience is and what meaning you can extract from it. Why is it pointless to search for the meaning of life? Well, for a universal meaning for every human being. Mm. I don't know. If we can speculate on it, but each person filters their reality according to what they value. So the meaning that people give it, if you meet somebody that has a high value on family, they will probably say the meaning of life is to procreate and have beautiful children, etc. Mm. If you meet somebody that's in business and finance, the meaning of life is to be productive and be of service. You get somebody who's dedicated to academics, the meaning of life is to gain knowledge. Mm. Um, everybody's going to filter it according to what their own individual values are and whatever is highest in their value is where they're going to have the most meaning. Right. So, but I don't know if there's a universal meaning. I don't mm. think any philosopher is able to pin that down. No. It's like there's no universal value system. Right. Some people say to me, not all things that happen have um, upside. You know, like children getting abused or, um, you know, just terrible misfortune. These poor people recently who went down to see the Titanic and ironically perished. Does everything have an upside? Even yeah. the, the worst trauma yes. and torture? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> I have yet to find uh, an event in uh, consulting with people or doing the breakthrough experience that we haven't been able to find it. People may choose to be morally absolute in their perception and this is evil and this is good and I've met people that do that but um, if we go and ask, we can always find something that allows them to see it from a different perspective and balance it out. Um, so, yeah, I believe there's two sides to it, no matter what it is. There, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't found anything. I haven't seen anything that so far that's been approached to me, and I've done thousands of cases that I haven't been able to find the upsides to so far. So if you're an innocent child and you're abused, how, how does that have upside? Well, abuse is a first a label that somebody's put on that. And that's, I mean, we could say, well, that's abuse, but abuse is a term we use for something that we've artificially labeled bad and we don't see upsides to. So that's a contradiction because if you say it's an abuse, you've already labeled it bad and you haven't seen the benefits. But Oprah Winfrey was, quote, that way. And she's one of the most powerful women on the planet. Mm. So it's not what happens to you, it's what you decide to do with it, how you perceive it. 
So if you sit there and become a victim of history and run your story about how it's all bad, then you've got a bad experience all your life. Mm. If you go and find out how it could be used in a powerful way that can serve people and yourself, then it can be very transformative. Mm. And uh, is, is this what you mean by voids create values? The things that we <coughs> lack in our lives, we search to fill? Yes. Let's say you meet somebody that you put on a pedestal, and you infatuate with them, and you minimize yourself to them. You're intimidated by them, and you're too humble to admit what you see in them inside you. Well, that's a disowned part, and that's a deflected part, and a dismemberment, as some have said. And that's an emptiness, that's a void, that's a judgment that you've made that makes you feel empty. You can't judge people without having an emptiness. And if you put people in the pit and resent them, and you're too proud to admit what you see in them, you, know that you have also a disowned part, and that's a void. So anytime you judge somebody and have an inequity of, of your own mind and an inequity between you and other people, you, um, you create voids um, that then drive the values to fulfill those voids. It was a, a statement that has been passed down through many, many cultures that whatever we see in others is a reflection of ourselves. And I found that to be true. I've been doing transformational work with people for decades now, five decades. And I've yet to see a trait or an action in somebody that somebody judged that they couldn't find inside themselves. And every week when I do the breakthrough experience, people come and say, well, I, I've never done that. I pride myself in never being that way. And I said, let's look again. And then we discovered. Mm. Maybe I can share a story about it. Mm. It'd be an interesting story. Mm. Um, I had an opportunity to do a Palestinian and Israeli conflict. And there were five leaders from Israel and three leaders from Palestinian side in a room around a table, three on one and five on the other. <clears throat> and when you walked in, if you had a knife in there, it would just sit there, <laughs> but dense. <laughs> and uh, so I walk in and before I'm about to speak, the lady puts her hand up, one of the women who was one of the leaders, and she says, Dr. Martin, do you believe in absolute evil? And I said, no. And she said, well, I do. And I said, is it possible that that's one of the reasons why you've spent 14 years trying to negotiate and got nowhere? <laughs> and the, the translator and mediator chuckled because she said, spot on. Mm. So she caught it. And I said, so do you mind if I start the conversation about that question? And she said, no, I'd like to address that. I said, what do you define to be absolute evil? And, and what specific trait or action or inaction are you labeling absolute evil? She says, intolerance. Now, she could, I could see that she was being intolerant at the moment, but she couldn't see it. Mm. She was blind to her own behavior. So I said, intolerance. And I said, okay, so we'll, let's, write it, let's pull out the forms and let's write down an intolerance. You feel that this individual is intolerant. Now the person she was talking about is the man sitting there across the table mm. who she perceives as intolerant. And I said, so, okay, so now let's go to a moment where and when you perceive yourself displaying or demonstrating that same specific trait, action and action, which is the intolerance. I says, I pride myself on never being that. I would never be intolerant. Nobody would ever see me intolerant. You could ask anybody and no one would ever tell you. It's very black and white, absolutes. Mm which means no resilience, no adaptability, and rightness. Very, very amygdala-driven behavior. And I said, well, that's interesting. I'm intolerant. I, I can think of a bunch of them. Do you mind if I share some of the times when I've been intolerant? I've been intolerant at restaurants when I, they get my order in, in, in balance. I've been intolerant at, at airports when they have, I have a first-class ticket and they don't have, they don't even have it registered, or my bags are missing. And I just started listing off where I'm intolerant, just in case some of those might be some places she's been intolerant. And finally she said, okay, well, I have, I've been intolerant that way and then that way. And I kept going until I got 39 examples in her life admitted where she's intolerant and absolute. And I kept going until she got teary-eyed because she realized, she humbled herself and she realized I'm pointing my finger, but there's three pointing back at me. It's, it's, it's myself. I said, we only judge other people that remind us of things about ourselves that we're not loving and we're feeling ashamed of and they're reminding us of it. And so we want to avoid them and label them to avoid them and dissociate and to go into pride to protect ourselves from what we're feeling ashamed of. 
I said, so this man is pushing this button or this individual is pushing your button because it's reminding of something you feel ashamed of because it's not matching the social idealism and religious idealism that you think you're supposed to be living by. And she just took that in and just kind of absorbed that and got a tear in the eye. And I said, can you see now that you're intolerant? And she goes, I can. Mm. She softened. Mm. Meantime, I'm watching the behavior of the, on this Palestinian side and they're doing the same thing and, and they're nodding your head. So I know I've got agreements. Mm. I said, now, let's go and ask another question. Let's go to a moment when this individual, not through hearsay, but through actual perceptions, has actually been intolerant. Okay. And then um, she said, yeah, this, I said, where was it? And when was it? Let's pin it down so it's real, not hearsay. Okay, got it. Okay. And who is he intolerant to? Got it. And who perceived him intolerant? Yes, me. Okay, great. At that moment, how did that benefit you? What was the benefit side and upside to that? Well, there is no benefit. I can't find any. I don't know. I said, I didn't ask those. Those are all dodging questions. And you said that within two, two tenths of a second, which means you didn't even attempt to look because you don't want to look. So that's not a question. The question is, what's the benefit of that happening in your life? Well, I can't see any. I said, look again. You haven't chosen to look. Well, I don't know. I just, you, I just said, don't, let's find an answer. Let's find out how it served you. And she says, I, I, I'm, I'm blank. And I said, before this individual did that, what were you doing? What was your career? She says, well, I was a stay-at-home mom. I said, after he did that, what happened? Well, I got involved in, in this, this political and debate. I said, did, and what did you do? Did you go and study? Did you learn? Yes, I, I, I went back to school. So this gentleman, by doing this behavior, led you to go back and ad advance your education. She goes, yes. Did you ever thank him for that? No, I never, didn't even think about that. I said, what else? Aren't you a leader today? She goes, yes. Was that catalyzed? Were you a leader before you, this man did this? No. Did you become a leader in a, in, of the movement in that as a result of that? Yes. And have you met a bunch of noted people and presidents and prime ministers and all kind of people? Yes, I have. Did you thank him for that? <laughs> and I kept going. I got 32 different benefits extracted out of her, but I just kept asking questions. Mm. And when she got through, she got teary-eyed again. Because when they balanced, she wasn't looking down on this man. She was looking across at this man. I said, so you've never thanked him? And then I said, you've been involved for 14 years trying to mediate a conflict. I said, but you haven't got anywhere because you've been right looking down and denying where you've done this and didn't see the benefits to it. So are you really committed to having a mediation? Or are you committed to getting fame and fortune out of this and getting contacts and you're getting into that and just keeping this thing going? I confronted her and she said, boy, that's a confronting question. I said, cause it sounds to me that you didn't really want to come. You didn't really want to mediate anything. You wanted to get known and be a leader and have people follow you, which is what you do. A bunch of angry people. And she goes, I'm humbled. I said, do you really want to mediate this? She goes, yes. I said, then what's the benefit? Let's keep going until we can do it. Because as long as you are superior to this person looking down and disowning the trade and projecting onto him, you're not going to get anything except retaliation and resentment mm. back because you're being above. And whenever you're above, people want to bring you down. So anyway, we found enough benefits until she got teary eyed and started bawling. And I said, I said, right now, are you feeling that it's an absolute evil individual? She goes, did you perceive because you didn't have the awareness and breadth of information, you just assumed this was an absolute evil because you didn't take the time to look? She goes, yeah. Mm. I said, I bought in. She said, I bought into the moral ideal. I said, that will trap you. That's not a truth. It's just a belief system that some human being came up with. Mm. I said, so... Right now, are you resenting this individual and thinking this is an absolute evil individual or he's just a human being doing the same things you've done? Because I see that. She says, I'd like to go to the restroom and clean up the makeup. So when she goes to the restroom, the guy comes up to me and says, I could swear that this lady was talking about me. And I said, she was. And she goes, I'm not angry at her anymore. Well, I've been, as you've been doing this, I've been reflecting and doing the same thing, which is what my goal was. And she's now dissolved and he's now dissolved. And they came back in the room and they gave each other a hug. Mm. These people want to kill each other when they walked in. Mm. 
So they both had this idea. I don't know for a fact that he did, but I could suspect by his mannerisms. But she actually had a belief that this was absolute evil. He probably thought she was absolute evil. And these are basically incomplete awarenesses that people label. And the way the mind is set up, whenever it's confronted by something, it labels torture or trauma. It will dissociate with a freeze response and create an ecstatic compensation in the brain to balance it. And most people aren't aware of that. And then if you go in and know how to access the unconscious and get information out of that and put these two together, this thing called abuse doesn't have any meaning because the thing that we, we've chosen to see only a downside, and I don't choose to do it. I confront the psychologists that label the kid that he's been abused and that you're, you're a victim of that, and that's a very disempowering way of looking at it. The question is, is whatever's happened, how are you now going to use it to do something extraordinary with your life? Mm. I had a boy that came to me, um, and he was an abandoned child he believed he had an abandoned child, then his father died, so now he's part orphan and abandoned by the family and uh, raised by a foster and was running this story, running this story, running this story about how terrible it was and how these statistics that these psychologists imposed on him, you, you have a probability of being a drunk and an alcoholic and this and that, and, and it was just crazy uh, indoctrinization. And I said, you can, can you look, you know how to do the internet? And he goes, yeah. <clears throat> he says, you got a phone? And he goes, yeah. Let's look something up. Let's look up the famous names and celebrities of done, who've done extraordinary things that were abandoned and orphans. There were 700 names, you know, from Clinton to, you know, Sir Isaac Newton. And we made a list of all the people. And I said, do you know who that is? And let's look him up. He was one of the most famous scientists. And this is a famous politician. This. By the time I got to about 14 different names that we looked up all these people that... I said, you are a special individual. You've been blessed to have the same origins as some of the greatest people in the world. So if you want to make this abuse and get your psychologist to label it abuse, to me that's futile. But if you go in and say this is an opportunity to do something extraordinary with your life, it can be utile. Mm. So no, I'm going to answer that as an absolutely, uh, it's, it's what you make out of it. Mm. You can turn anything you've, there's nothing your mortal body can experience that you as an authentic individual can't turn into something that's useful and to love. Mm. And therefore, is poverty a choice? It is to some degree, because it's a choice of value systems and it's a choice of how you, whenever you do make anything, how you spend it and distribute it. I mean, I've seen people in townships of South Africa make 60 cents a day as a 14 year old kid, turn around and save 15 cents a day and within a one year and three month period was able to put $200 or $30 down on a $200 house and started saving and investing money. Mm. And he was only making 60 cents a day. So he had a choice and most of the kids didn't do that. Most of the kids were in poverty and they, they, they wanted a cell phone and blow their money and live beyond their means and so they'd never get ahead. Mm. This kid chose a different path after coming to a talk we did. Mm. So I don't, I, I'm not saying it's easy, I'm not saying it's, it's not more challenging, but you always hear about somebody that came from extreme poverty and went out and did something extremely powerful. Mm. And you also have met people that come from extreme wealth and they do nothing with their life and squander money. Mm. Rags to riches to rags. We are in disruptive financial times, interest rates going up, the banking system, the government, taxation. So I've created my Digital Financial Freedom Toolkit, a toolkit to help you save money in the right areas and scale and make money in the right areas. In the description and the comments below, you can find a link, go get it for free. Authenticity or being yourself. I wanna talk about that because like how do you be authentic and how do you really know who you are? Right? To me, that seems one of the most complicated questions in life. I feel like, depends on my mood. I've got multiple personalities. I could be anyone or anything. I'm attracted by lots of different things. And, and, and I really don't, you know, sometimes I feel bullish towards like, yeah, I've got a lot of haters and critics online and I'm gonna defend myself. And then other days I just wanna hide from them. And how do you really know who you are and f discover this authentic self? You're the synthesis of it all. All of those woven together. So let me elaborate on that, because I like that topic. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll start back where we were, when we were talking about infatuation. You meet somebody, you go into a mall, you meet somebody, and you go, wow, that guy's 
uh, more intelligent than me, or that guy's more successful than me, or he's wealthier than me, or he's got a more stable relationship or a prettier spouse or something, or more socially connected on Facebook or YouTube or something, or he's got more physical fitness, or he's more spiritually aware, enlightened. We go around and we make assessments of people based on our search images and our value system. And if we assume, because what we, we meet them, we may not get to know who they really are, but we, may, we make an assumption that they have something we don't. And the moment we put them on a pedestal and are too humble to admit what we see in them is inside us and minimize ourselves and exaggerate them, uh, we, we aren't being authentic, we're minimizing. And we feel a little humble and shamed relative to them because we're not living up to what we think they're doing. So that's an inauthenticity. And then if we meet somebody and we look down on them, then we think, well, I'm more successful than them or more intelligent than them or more wealthy than them. In the reverse manner, we tend to puff ourselves up and inflate ourselves, and that pride is not our authentic self. Both our minimized or exaggerated side are not authentic. And this excess or deficient perspective is called elevated self-esteem or depressed self-esteem, or self-righteous, self-raunchous, or inflated or deflated ego. It's got a hundred names by various writers. Um, but whatever the names are, the synthesis of that, the synthesis is the authentic self. So if you minimize yourself to somebody, you're going below yourself. If you go above it, you go above yourself. But most people don't realize that there's a license, what they call moral licensing effect. The second we go above, we automatically unconsciously give ourselves permission to do something to go below. People go out and work out and they feel like they've done some really good workout and they go and eat chocolate and, and, and drink some wine that night because they gave themselves permission by the licensing effect to bring them down. And what that is is a homeostatic mechanism inside the psyche to bring it back into authenticity. So we have literally an interceptive homeostatic um, psychostat inside our brain to try to bring us back into an equilibrium point. But we get with moral hypocrisies that we've been taught, that we've subordinated to, mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, about how we're supposed to be, that we're constantly trying to perturb that center point and go off and try to be one-sided. And that keeps us vacillating back and forth in these different personas and imposter syndromes. But the center is real. And the moment we have a center, uh, we get a sign, which is a, a tear of gratitude that occurs when we're authentic. You probably had moments when you read something or listened to something, you got a tear in your eye and you go, wow, and you just know it locks in, you know something's there. That's a moment of authenticity. It's a gamma synchronicity in the brain waves. Uh, if you have something, if you look up to something and it supports your values and you're, you're inspired by it, look up, not inspired, but infatuated with it, uh, you get a parasympathetic response, which tends to slow down the, the heart rate and, and uh, brain wave weight down to three and four cycles per second. If you get something that challenges you, it tends to go up into beta waves and at about 13 cycles per second. But if those come into perfect balance, you get to a seven to eight cycle alpha theta wave, which triggers off gamma synchronicities. The whole brain synchronizes, and that's when you get the tear, the eureka moment, the aha moment that, ah, I'm on track. And so there is a sign of authenticity that has a state of certainty you're grateful, you'll feel a feeling of love, you'll feel inspired, you'll feel enthused about taking actions in a meaningful way that's serving, philanthropic. You'll have a, a feeling of certainty and you'll feel like you're present. You're not thinking about the future or worrying about the past or, you know, or dwelling on the past, you're there. And that authentic moment, um, you don't question. And each of us have moments where we have that, but it usually is moving around all around that center point and the quality of our life is basically quite the questions we ask. If we ask questions that bring that back into center, we can increase the probability of having the center. When the center's there, our medial prefrontal cortex, which is the seat of the self, according to Scientific American, uh, lights up. And if we're not, and we're oscillating, our amygdala and our subcortical areas of the brain and the hippocampus is firing, and we call that the subconscious mind, and it's wobbling all over the place with the imposter. But when we're centered, there's a, there's a confirmation there's a, there's a brainwave confirmation, there's a psychological confirmation, there's a way of knowing. And you don't have a question, but most people are oscillating around it and never get into that center point. When they're actually centered, there's a knowing. Mm. And now you're an authentic and there'll be tears of gratitude because you won't be judging anybody, nor yourself. You're not minimizing or exaggerating others, you're not exaggerating or minimizing yourself in return. Mm. You're just being yourself. 
Yeah. And that's the most powerful. When you see a, a Grammy Award winner, uh, one of my students got his third Grammy, and I uh, was watching this thing on the thing. He was speechless. He had tears in his eyes. He was in a state of grace. He felt love for what he was doing, love for the people he worked with. He was certain about uh, the, the mission that he was on. All those are signs of in a moment of authenticity and a standing ovation is spontaneous in the audience. If I'm authentic when I'm speaking, I get a standing ovation. Pretty, pretty standard. Yeah. Wow. Um, is there a God? <laughs> we first have to ask, what are we defining God to be? Uh, if we're dealing with an anthropomorphic deity that is a punish rewarding God um, that has been used by many cultures through time, um, yes, it's in the minds of human beings that believe that. Uh, it's not a phenomenal thing that you can measure with your senses, so it's not a, something you can define by some empirical mechanism, but it is a belief system that people have. But that is the most banal, lowest level of religious idealisms, in my opinion. And it's usually a compensation from phobias of the past and fantasies of the future. Um, those are pseudo-religious, in my opinion. You could say that the laws of the universe, the, I'd rather come from an idea that the principles or laws of the universe that do not change, per se, that we can go and uncover in our, in our exploration, would be an expression of, uh, I'd want to say that it's some sort of a design because it's an anthropomorphism again, but it's a, a, a field of intelligence that permeates the universe that somehow is, uh, is allowing itself to be expressed. And to me, my idea of, you know, there's, there's, there's the, the amount of deities and gods that have been on this planet for thousands of years are thousands. There's thousands of them. And most of them have gone extinct because they don't have the phobia that drives them. You know, if we had a fear of thunder, we had a thunder god. A fear of rain, we had a rain god. If we understand what it is scientifically, we don't have, those, those gods go away because we would appease them out of our anxieties. We would, we would initiate that. There's an area of our uh, parietal uh, temporal cortex that if you electri electrically stimulate it with a magnetic stimulation, electrical stimulation, it fires off uh, the, the idea that you're talking to some sort of an identity. They found out when you're under extreme traumas and you go through a dissociative state of, as a survival, a freeze response, that area lights up and, it's, and we create the opposite of whatever we're perceiving that we're traumatized by and we create the opposite in our mind based on all associations in our previous part of our life. And we then give it some sort of an anthropomorphic idea, an agenticity we call it. So we, we wake up. When we're under high stress, we activate patternicity, apophilia, um, uh, agenticity. We, we create pareidolia. These are all the kind of states that they found that are initially in brain development, the things that were initiated thousands of years through the idea of developing gods were, were things that were done as a basic survival mechanism from things we were frightened by. We were frightened originally by, by whatever was could kill us. And so we'd go hide in a cave and we had geomorphic types of gods and we worshiped sacred rocks and things at one time. And then plants, we had sacred plants. We eat a plant, it would give us life. And if we ate the plant, it would kill us. So we worship plants. And then we got animals that could be alive, we could kill us or give us food. And so we had uh, zoomorphic gods. And then we went from there to anthropomorphic gods because man became more frightening than the animals eventually when we knew we had to hunt in groups. So we can see that the, as we've had our anxieties and fears evolve in our brain, we've gone from subcortical areas of the brain into a more advanced part of the brains and became more abstract and more mathematical and more um, aware of the laws of the universe. And so the constructs of, of theology, which are personifications in many cases of, of astronomy and optics and life, um, have moved towards more of a mathematical abstraction. And I think the laws of conservation, the laws of, of pairs of opposites, the law of the law of the one of many, uh, these are fundamental laws that we find in almost every discipline that I've studied, 300 different disciplines, I found those laws applying. The study of those laws and whatever intelligence in the universe that's inherent in nature 
um, I would pers if you want to personify it, I'd just say that that's the, the grand organized design of the universe. Scientists would not probe into the mysteries of the universe if they had not believed somehow that there was some sort of rational order inside all this random chaos stuff. Mm. So the pursuit of the hidden order in the apparent chaos, which is innate inside it with our search for patterns and things, um, has evolved the construct of God through time from anthropomorphic deities to eventually abstract mathematical expressions of the laws of the universe. Mm. So we've gone from kind of an animistic and mystical um, to some sort of a mythological to something maybe metaphysical and philosophical to something more scientific to eventually more mathematical. And mathematical is the most universal language we have. But a, a, a universal law doesn't, it doesn't get violated by human beings. A human law does. And most human laws are the source of why we get all the judgments that I mentioned earlier and all the inequities that we have. Mm. Does everything happen for a reason? Well, again, that's the question, like, is there meaning to things? The reason you give it. I can take somebody that, uh, I, I'll give you a story. <laughs> so I had this guy who, who uh, contacted me for a consult. And uh, I'm not going to say where he came from because he may be watching this, but, but he contacted me for a consult and he was hijacked on the freeway. Four cars came around him and uh, surrounded his car and got out with, with uh, heavy duty equipment <laughs> and basically threatened him and made him broke open his window and uh, grabbed him from the car, put a head thing over his head, put him in the trunk, left his car there and drove off and drove for five hours or something like in the middle of nowhere and basically said, you know, it's a large sum of money, a ransom. So he had to come up with a large sum of money and they threatened his family and they're going to kill his family if he didn't come up with it. And so it was pretty, you would think this would be traumatic. You, that, that, most people would have jumped to the conclusion that that's a traumatic, crazy thing to happen. So he, he's been, for months, he's been going to this specialist and therapist or whatever to try to figure out what to do with this. And he's having nightmares and he's, you know, scared and all this stuff. Because he, he, he paid the money. He got set free out in the middle of nowhere and walked his way to back to civilization kind of thing. So I asked him, so what was the benefit of this? And he looked at me like, what? I said, so what was the benefit? Go to the actual moment when you're in the trunk and you're in darkness and you smell fumes and you're frightened and you need to pee and you can't and you, you don't know if you're going to be dead. You don't know if they're going to kill your family. What did, what did your mind do at that moment? Go there. Because the mind cannot have a one-sided experience. And most psychology doesn't let you know that, but it's a physiological thing. We have a memory and an anti-memory, and the anti-memory comes on at the same time the memory does, but one's conscious, the other's unconscious. And if you don't know how to ask the right questions, you can't access the unconscious. But I asked him at that moment, go to that moment. In that moment, where was the other side? And all of a sudden, he saw himself while he was sitting there, cramped, constrained, in the dark, with fumes, holding hands with his kids and his wife running through a field in fresh air with sunshine. Dark light. Isolated from family, they're going to die. He's got them close. The very anti-memory, the associations in the brain were, were spontaneously counterbalancing this in order to maintain, homeos to maintain homeostasis in the brain. So I asked him, so what's the benefit of that? He said, well, that was the moment that I had a snap and realized how important my family was. He cried. He says, I had no idea how valuable my family was until that moment. I've been so busy with my business, so this, money and this and everything, but I just realized how, how valuable my family was. I said, how much is that worth? He says, it's priceless. I said, no, how much is it worth? Put a dollar value on it. He says, I don't know, man. I said, well, let's go. What else? What's another benefit at that moment? He said, well, since that happened in that moment, I realized that if I'm not there, what will happen? I contemplate what would happen to my business if all of a sudden I never got back to go back to business. And then, he, and then he said, he says, well, not at that moment, but I've been discovered when I came back that during the, the weeks I was away from the business in isolation, raising the funds for this thing, my staff that I've been wanting to rise up and to take on accountabilities rose up. We made the biggest month while I was gone. The business boomed and they're running it. And now I'm back. I'm with my family. I'm working out. I've lost weight. I'm eating differently. Um, I'm, I know my wife, I appreciate my kids, 
the business is running. I'm, it's delegated. I got teams that are doing it and it's making more money and I'm now ahead. I said, well, how much do they get? X. How much is it generated? 15X. I said, so is that a consulting fee? Were they consultants that came in to make sure you got the things that you're wanting to do? That you're... And he, she goes, you got a strange way of looking at it. <laughs> and I said, well, why would you not want to look at it in a way that you're empowered by it? Mm. Why would you want to run the story and be a victim and, and hide in anxiety and fear over nothing when you don't have to? Yeah. So I, I kept playing with it until the very end. He's sitting there going, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened in my life. Mm. And I said, great. You mm. now see both sides of this. He says, when I think about it, all of my things that were in my mind that I was wishing I could get done, but I never got around to doing, I kept telling, stalling my wife. I kept stalling this. I kept interfering with the, the, the teams taking on because I kept rescuing from it. All the things that I was actually hoping would get done got done by that one act. Mm. I said, so there was now a value to that now. She, he goes, yeah. I said, can you see now the reasons and meaning this whole thing happened? You had an unconscious motive. This thing came to fruition. He goes, I can't believe I'm doing I'm actually grateful for him. I, mm. I said, can you see that for the small thing? Could, have, you, have you ever paid for consulting? He said, yeah. Have you ever got that much result? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> that was the most powerful mm. way of getting me to get the job done. And most people don't realize that the events in their life have those type of catalytic effects. So, but I asked him those questions that nobody was willing to ask him. Hmm. What's the blessing of this one? Yeah. So when um, I asked you, does everything happen for a reason? I think I've heard you say that nature gives you the feedback and the lessons that you need to always try and bring you back into balance. Yep. Is that an example of that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because I asked him another question. I said, if this had never happened, what would be the drawback to you? You know, one of his statements, I might be dead. Hmm because my heart was racing, the stress levels were overwhelming, my weight was going up, yeah. I had a hypertension, and my wife was probably going to divorce me, and I would have been bitter if she was to take all my wealth and my mm. business. And now that's all been solved. Mm. I said, okay, you grateful now? He yeah. goes, yeah, I can't, I'm not angry right now, I'm not hurt, I'm not anxiety. I got a letter from him that very night, or the next morning, the next night, pardon me, um, he sent an email. I got. I saw it that night, but he came and sent in that day. He says, "I've I've slept. Mm. I can sleep. He couldn't sleep because mm. he's running around all this stuff. Every time we have an imbalanced perspective, any infatuation or any resentment, any ecstasy or any torture, occupies space and time in our mind and runs us until we bring it back into balance. The moment we do, our authentic self comes in mon online." And his authentic self was grateful. The authentic self is grateful. It mm. sees the hidden order in the apparent chaos. Mm. We talk about this a lot, Harry, don't we, in, in the car, because Harry gets pissed off with people. Oh, they <laughs> me over. They did this, they did that. They, they, yeah. And I, I sort of try and say to Harry, well, you, you know, maybe they're your greatest teachers, uh, and, and maybe they help you the most. And so I think isn't part of your breakthrough experience where you get people to look at people they're resenting and find out actually why they are your greatest gift and your greatest teacher? Well, I wouldn't go as far as always saying greatest, one of the great teachers, because <laughs> there's going to be a lot of those greatest. Yeah. Greatest means the very top, Right. but great. Yeah. Um, anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. So it's up to you. Uh, I, I noticed back 39 years ago that whenever I would emphasize something to somebody or react to somebody, I would judge them, um, you know, and I was whispering in my head, I go, I've done that and I'm doing the same thing and I'm talking to myself here, even though I'm, I'm yelling at them sometimes. And I, instead of waiting with reacting to people when it occurred, I decided to go to an Oxford Dictionary the Oxford English Dictionary, that big thick one with the thin paper, and look through that and go through page by page by page and underline or circle, depending on um, every human behavioral trait I could find. And I found 4,628 traits in there. And then I wrote out to the side the abbreviation of the individual who I perceive being the most extreme example of somebody I personally have known that demonstrate that trait. When I think of that 
trade, I think of them. And I wrote that out there. Then I asked myself, not as sophisticated I do today, but at the time, a kind of a cursory view. And I wasn't as thorough as I'd be today. But I asked, so where have I done that? When have I done that? Who have I done that to? Who perceives me doing that? And I looked until I could identify where I've done it to the degree of the individual who I perceive exemplified it the most. And I found them all. Mm. I was nice and mean and kind and cruel and stingy and generous and open and closed and greedy and you know, philanthropic and different settings under different things. I found out that if I meet somebody who has a similar value to me, they'll look at me and they go, God, he's dedicated, he's perseverant, he's relentless, he's mm you know, focused, and then somebody has a complete opposite set of values that may be focused on their children or something or going to church or something, they'll say, he's pig-headed, he's rigid, he's lazy. Un lazy, mm -hmm. you know. The same behavior will be perceived different ways, and the reality is, in those contexts, I'm all those. Mm -hmm. And so once I realize I'm all the behaviors in different contexts, it's easy to own the traits, a lot easier to own the traits because I'm all those. Mm. I am rigid to anybody that wants to do something different than what I'm wanting to do. Yeah. I'm, I'm perceived as rigid because I stay focused on it. Mm. You know, I mean, you'd be probably rigid about going and doing a service to people and giving your podcast, mm. do it every day yeah. or something. You know, they'd probably say, well, he's rigid and he's not playing baseball. Mm. I, I had this lovely lady on the ship that um, was from Australia that's a fitness, you know, she loves fitness. So six, seven in the morning, she's in the fitness gym, and she's there till seven o'clock at night. Twelve hours a day doing fitness, and doing classes and teaching people and helping people in their workouts and stuff like that. Fitness, fitness, fitness. And I walk by her and she says, "I haven't seen you in the gym. Come on, let's get in the gym. Let's go. Get in the gym." Or, and I go in there, but I don't go as much as she does by any means. And I, at first, I said, "Thank you for reminding. I, I might come in here in a couple of days." And then after a while, I started doing. I haven't seen you in the library. Come on, let's go to the library. <laughs> yeah. Why are you not reading today? She goes, ooh, I did it again, didn't I? I said, yeah, you're projecting your values onto me, and that's pretty normal. But if I don't respond, it's because I have a different set of values. And so I you know, gave her some feedback, mm. and she was laughing at herself for doing that because she's so, you know, we all project our values onto other people. That's yeah. how we, we show our love. Mm. And um, everything that happens to us in our lives, do we attract it? Um, we could use the term attract, we could use the term resonate, we could use the term seek out, there's many ways of looking at it. Uh, imagine a magnet with a positive negative pole, and you're here in the center, and you seek this one and you're trying to avoid that one. Well, if you seek this one, you're seeking that which is unobtainable because if you try to take the magnet and get only a positive pole the magnet, you can't get it. You can't chop it in half and get a positive pole, you get a positive negative. You chop it in half, you get a positive negative. Chop it in half, you get a positive negative. You could chop it down as long as there's an atom left. There's, with a dipole moment, there's some sort of polarity and a magnetism there. So you're searching for that which is unobtainable, and you're trying to avoid that which is unavoidable. So anytime you seek out a one-sided thing that you like, its opposite comes with it. Mm. So if you get a relationship with somebody and you like a trait, you know, that they're highly intelligent. You know, a lot of girls are looking for highly intelligent guys, for instance. Mm. But with it comes the downside, the other side of the pole. Mm. Maybe they're, they're, they argue, or maybe they think they're right, or maybe they don't want to be listen, or they want, mm. they're condescending in their knowledge, or whatever. That's the price that comes. And, and so you want the one side, but you don't want the yeah. other, but that's futile. And so it's true love, appreciating all sides Both of them. Yeah, you, you're, you're not going to have an embracing, authentic love for somebody if you're trying to get rid of half of them mm. and only get one side. So the more you seek one side, the more the shadow comes with it. The more you, so I say if you seek protection, you attract aggression. If you seek ease, you attract difficulty. You seek uh, freedom, you get constraint. There's always a pair of opposites. And this has been written about since the time of Heraclitus, 5th century, 6th wow. century BC. It's not new. So you get the opposite of that which you seek. Yeah, you get both. Yeah, because you, you can't get, get one. You can't get both. <clears throat> You're, yeah. I'm a nice person if you support my values. Yeah. I'm a mean as a tiger if you challenge them. Yeah. So when you come with me and you get with me, uh, you're gonna get nice and mean, <laughs> kind mm. and cruel, positive and negative, supportive and challenging. Yeah. And so you don't get a one-sided thing. So anybody searching for one side, the more the other side is painful. 
Right. So the more you're addicted to one side, the more you're subject from the other, and the subjection right. is pain, and this is pleasure in your so mind. The more infatuation, the more depression. More comes depression, with it. because you fear the loss of what you infatuate. Right. Yeah. And you fear the gain of its opposite. So the more you polarize something and search with impulse and avoid with instinct, the more polarized you are, the more you fear the loss of this one, the more you fear the gain of this one, and that fear is a feedback to let you know that you're in balance and not seeing both sides and embracing both sides with love. And you're not authentic, because mm. here you're infatuated with them and you're minimizing yourself. Here you're resenting them and exaggerating yourself. So you get a feedback from philias and phobias as a feedback, positive and negative poles of a magnet to let you know when you're not balanced. Because they occupy space and time in your mind and run your mind and make it hard to sleep at night. Wow. So Andrew Tate controversially said that um, some women especially should take some responsibility for being uh, What do you think about that? Well, I've done about 1,300 plus cases of cases, not having 1,300 people. <laughs> but, yeah, you wouldn't tell that on yeah, the That made me misinterpreted. Yeah. But I've helped women who have been many, many, many times. Mm. And I've yet to see one who are willing to work. Sometimes they'll run and they don't want to address the questions. Um, but I've yet to see it that can't be turned into something they can be grateful for and move on. And it's hard to comprehend that until you see it. Wow. Most people don't. So people, can, you, you, people can be grateful, grateful for, for the event. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's hard to believe. How? By what well, the first thing you think you do is most people start with a general tr a straight uh, statement that says, mm. and they say, well, that's evil, mm. right? That's their program. They've been taught that and it's whatever. They don't understand the history of where that process came about and why people do that and the motives behind it and the roles people play in it. I, I was f fascinated by that because it, when I was in, uh, undergraduate at University of Houston, there was a dormitory with hundreds of women in it, but only one woman was in five times in one year, no one else was raped. I was going, why is one and none of the other ones? I was just thought, is it because she's attractive? Is she walk a certain way? I was trying to figure out what this. So that started me on a curiosity of that topic. And we found some things, we found patterns. So if I take somebody who comes to me in the breakthrough experience and said, I've been okay. So if we start with uh, we need to break it down. So we find there's usually about 18 different subcomponents of For instance, it could be threat is a subcomponent. They verbally threatened me and said if I spoke or said anything or whatever, they would kill me or they would destroy my family or whatever, or, or slice me with a knife or something. Mm. So verbal threat is a subcomponent very commonly. Another one is constrain me. They tied me or they held me down. There's a constraint factor. The other one is they penetrated and violated my innocence without my request. So they'll put that down. But if we break all the, the components down, on average there's about nine, could be 10 or 11, but nine is common. But out of 18, I see these patterns of what they have actually define it to be. And they, when they break it down, they go, oh, that's interesting. Um, I didn't ever really deconstruct what that was that I'm actually judging because it's not It's just a general term and you deal with general terms You can't get very much accomplished because you're dealing with broad generalities instead of the specific actions You always want to break the label that people are traumatized by in their mind into into specific actions Once we do that we then go, okay, so where have you threatened somebody? And they go boyfriend dad grocery store guy, we start listing where we did it and I have go and dig and dig and dig and dig and dig until the quantity of their threats are equal. And surprisingly, it's not that difficult to actually see where they've done these behaviors because we only judge in things in other people that represent parts of us that we've got buried inside that we're not loving and we're resenting or feeling ashamed of. So it's, it's eye-opening to them to realize that. So we go in there and identify each one of those components where have you penetrated somebody? Or where did you want to have sex when they didn't want to? And they go, my boyfriend, <laughs> at two in the morning. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, my boyfriend thought I was uh, highly sexually focused or something. And they go and I, they own all these traits. Mm. And I've, like I said, I've done this over a thousand times, 1,300 times. I haven't found one that didn't, wasn't able to get these things answered when they were broken down. Unless they just ran out. They just mm. didn't want to deal with it. And that's one out of maybe 400 or something. So are you saying the people who experienced were people who had projected as many of those traits onto other people? 
No, they, they had done those behaviors yeah. and were judging themselves many times for this right. and unaware on an unconscious level that this was going on. And it was surprising when they finally got to this. Yeah. And, and some need a little assistance. Some are really, really charged up about it mm. and really, like it just happened that day, for instance. Like very one-sided, you mean, in their yeah, emotions very one -sided. and perceptions. And so I stay with them until we get past that. Yeah. And it's sometimes hours. I've seen it take three hours sometimes to get through past this, through that. Wow. But once we go finish that, they, they start to humble themselves a little bit. Mm. Because I said, it's not fair to judge another person for something we've done in our own lives. Mm. It's wiser to go and look, reflect first yeah. before we point our finger, because there's three pointing back. And as a, there's an old statement in the, in, the, in the New Testament called in Romans 2.1, it says that, you know, those things that you judge in others, be careful because they, they are things you've done yourself. Mm. It's an old proverb. It's yeah. been stated in many philosophies. So we go through that. Then we go to the next come. Now go to the exact moment this occurred when they actually did this behavior. They pinned you down and constrained you. Good. At that moment, what was the benefit? Well, there was no benefit. That's what they start with. And anytime you have no benefit, you're, you're black and white. And people that are black and white have no resilience, no adaptability, because they're now living in an in instinct to avoid and a fantasy of the other side. And they actually dissociate and create fantasies, can create bipolar responses, not because of the event, but because of the way they responded to the event. Mm. So I go in there and I said, what's the benefit side? Okay, and then they, they'll say things like, uh, well, I definitely became uh, more studious and what got in focused at school. Okay, and how did that, what was the secondary benefit of that? Well, I became entrepreneur and I didn't, I rely, never wanted to rely on man. Mm. So I decided to run my own business. Okay, and what's the benefit that came out of that? I'm done pretty well. Yeah. I said, so that catalyst it was, a, was part of it. Did you give him a percentage of the income that you've made? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. <laughs> I didn't think about that. So what's another benefit? Well, I stood up for myself and I was more withdrawn and I'm now, I got more out, outgoing. Or I, um, I got more reclusive and I went into study. Or I got more socially and I hung out with different people and I always made sure I got connected with people. There may be a variety of benefits that come out of there, but we go digging and digging and digging and just like the guy that was on the freeway. We don't stop until we get enough benefits to equal the drawbacks. Mm. And we may take five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, until the, the upsides are balanced there. And then they, they go, I've never imagined the upsides of this, but right now I can see that I got closer to my mom. I was not able to be myself around her. She found out I went through this and I found mm. out about my mom, things I didn't even know about her. And she opened up and my dad and my mom and my, my life changed, or our relationship changed. And now I didn't even know they really cared about me. Now I know they cared about me. So I got that out of it. Yeah. There's many different things that it could be that are benefits. But we go through and identify the benefits in each of those moments and secondary and tertiary benefits that came out of that until they look right now and they can say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, down the thing. Mm. But, and I'm not doing this to make that, the guy or the gal out there that's doing the activity right. I'm doing it to set them free from the torture they've made in their mind. That's a big difference. Mm. So I'm not saying go out and do, people think, well, if it's not bad, it must be good. Yeah. No, I'm not making it good or bad. I'm making an event. All events are events until somebody comes along and makes a heaven out of a hell or a hell out of a heaven out of it, as Milton said. So I go in there and I, I stack up the benefits until they're sitting there, usually getting tears in their eyes and their makeup running until they go, wow. And they're, all of a sudden their brain is, the noise in the brain's calmed down. I said, okay, now let's go further. Let's go to the moment when you did this behavior and let's find out how it benefited the people you were doing it to. Mm. So I remember you saying to me the last time we met, I think, or maybe the time before, I think I was just, um, my wife was pregnant with my first son and I was talking about how I was really looking forward to imparting my wisdom onto my son. And you said, well, you'll learn as much from him as he does from you. And you also said to me, you said, you don't make any mistakes raising your children. And you know, my wife, She's got a real way she wants to raise the kids and she beats herself up if she perceives they're not doing well at school. Or, yeah, that's the moral hypocrisy you get right, trapped in. Yeah, and I always you know, say to all, you know, John would say you don't make any mistakes with your children. H how do you mean we don't make any mistakes? Well, the, the, the child may be indoctrinated into an ideal and a fantasy about how it's supposed to be and the parents may be trapped in another ideal about how it should, should be and supposed to be, but that's not how anybody lives. Nietzsche said there's ought and there is. 
<laughs> people get right. trapped in the ought. Okay. And then so instead it, of what in it other is, words, it just it is what it, it is. is. Now the question is, is what are you going to do with it, and how can you use it to your advantage? I mean, Oprah was uh, had uh, yeah. supposedly incest, and so Oprah became Oprah. So, so is this like acceptance of what happens? No, it's 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 digging deeper. Acceptance assumes that there's something there you need to accept. It's going deeper and actually finding the other side to it, because when you see both sides of an event, it's not it's not good or bad. It's just an event. And now you're using it resourcefully and empowering your life with it by looking at how you can extract meaning out of it. The mean between the pairs of opposites. The mean is the pair that, you know, the positive and negative, the mean between them is the mean. That's what meaning means. To extract right. meaning out of existence is taking the things you infatuate or resent and finding the downsides and the upsides and bringing them to the mean and extracting the meaning of what this brought you. And when you do that, you now are inspired by what's happened and use it to a very empowering situation. We don't have to, we can be stuck in a label and how terrible this event is. And I've seen cultures do that for decades. Mm. But to me, that's just pointless. It, it's, it's a, you're getting stuck. And people, well, I don't want to lose the memory of this terrible event. I said, why? Why would you want to store a memory in your, your brain of that to, so you can be living in anxiety and fear and blame in all your life? Mm. False attribution biases don't empower people. When you blame others for your experience or you blame yourself for their experience, You've dissociated from what the cause, causalities are. You, you, you got in a world of causality instead of in a causal state, as Jung would describe. So is wisdom then, or um, foresight or whatever, just being able to see the upsides and downsides in every event, is that enlightenment? See, the, the speed in which you see both sides of an event is your wisdom. The speed in which you see both sides. Wilhelm Wundt in 1895 in his book on the principles of, of psychology, described two contrasts. One was sequential contrast, where you saw the other side over time, and you had the wisdom of the ages with the aging process. Mm. And the other is a simultaneous contrast, where you saw both sides simultaneously, and you had the wisdom of the ages without the aging process. Right. Yeah. And that's an enlightened state. And so most people don't live there. Most people run the story, yeah. and they be the victim. And, and, but the, the more aware individual has a broader awareness and sees neither good nor evil, sees neither positive nor negative, sees the whole and they have full con consciousness that's full, yeah. mindful, instead of mindless, seeing only one side. So let me finish this thing on this, right? So we go to that one. Then we go to the next question. Where does this individual demonstrate the opposite behavior? And that is mind blowing, because they may have threatened him, but then they may have been with him for 10 minutes and the threat was about four seconds. Mm. And so during the other time, did, was there a threat there? No, did, so you saw them when they're non-threatening? Yes. I remember one lady that I was doing a case, she says, um, the guy tied her up, and, and, and then he asked, Is, are you comfortable? <laughs> he didn't want to hurt her. Yeah. He didn't really want to hurt her. It's no. really quite interesting. Mm. And she heard that. She goes, I can't believe it. He even asked me, was that too tight? <laughs> so, so we have to find out where the opposite is to break the labels we have on people. And then the big one comes, the next question. Go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating this trait, this action, this inaction that you're judging and go get present there. Because in the moment of perception is when the conscious and unconscious mind split. And in that moment of perception is when the conscious and unconscious mind can be rejoined. So go back to that moment, you there? And at that moment, when I got that guy in the car, uh, to go into the moment when he's feeling, smelling the fumes, he's in a dark, constrained spot, his mind and his intuition brought up the vision of all of a sudden being with a walking in the field or running through the field with his wife and holding the kids' hands and butterflies and fresh air and everything, and the, the complete opposite, freedom. All the symbolisms that he had in his life that represented freedom and fresh air and health were symbolized at the same moment he was having the other. Mm. Now, so in the case, the same thing occurs. At the moment they're perceiving some sort of torture, they're being stabbed or whatever they are, their mind will dissociate. Many people have near-death experiences and have dissociations and have ecstatic experiences. And that area of the brain and the parietal temporal region of the brain lights up and it creates a dissociation and this is where many gods. Freud said that the, the dissociative identity state is where the gods were originated when we were frightened in nature thousands of years ago. That's where we got the idea of the gods because they were the things that would protect us from the things, they were the opposite of whatever it is we do. When we're running down a street in London and uh, it's late at night, we just come out of the theater and, uh, or pub or something and then you hear this guy running behind you with a hood on, and he's running towards you, and you go, is this guy gonna attack me or not? 
you immediately go, dear God, protect me. Mm -hmm. da, 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 da. You bring up an anthropomorphic deity to protect you and you start associating the opposite of what you're imagining could happen. And then it goes running by and it's just a jogger. Mm. See you later, God. Get back to you later. Everything's yeah. fine. <laughs> yeah. You reassociate. Mm. And then you feel comfortable again. So we automatically create superpowers, pseudo superpowers, the moment we feel powerless. And this is part of the brain doing its opposite. So in the rape case, the brain will dissociate if it's something that they feel trapped by. They can't run or they can't fight. If they can't fight or flight, they'll freeze. And they'll play a possum and they'll dissociate create an anti-memory in the brain that will counterbalance this. If I can identify what that is at that exact moment and put them together and show them at the same time, they'll get tears of gratitude in that moment. And they'll mm. realize the ecstasy and the torture were, were simultaneous. Mm. And then the Wilhelm once simultaneous contrast is born. And in that moment, there's authenticity. Because mm. if they're looking down and resenting somebody, they're superior. If they're up in ecstasy, they're down here. When you put the two together, authenticity comes and tear comes out. All of a sudden they go, the trauma's gone. Mm. Trauma is, post-traumatic stress is so simple to dissolve if you know how to do that. Mm. And just take them layer by layer by layer, you can dissolve these things. You know, millisecond moments and just take each one and do the opposite. So I go through the rape case and we go through each one of those steps and when they're done, they're going, I'm not traumatized, I don't mm. feel trauma. And then I said, so now, now, if they had done what you hoped they'd have done, you'll find out that the addiction to protection attracts aggression. The addiction to uh, innocence attracts the perpetrator sexually. Whatever your addiction is to one side, you attract the opposite to break the addiction because whatever you're addicted to, you become juvenilely dependent on. And so your authentic self wants you liberated from that because you're in bondage to that. And so it draws in the opposite simultaneously as the magnet in order to make sure you break that addiction with the opposite to set you free. Mm. So when you take, and take the person through the pro process, I mean, I have people who'll stand up right at the end of it in break two, and they'll stand up and said, and we'll have somebody play the role of the rapist, and we'll have them sit in a chair, and they'll embrace them and put their arms around them and say, thank you, you've wake, woke my life up. And I realize my role, and I see the dynamic in it, and I see the, there's nothing there except thank you. Mm. And they go, what? <laughs> people are shocked until they see it live. Mm. You try to tell somebody that, it's not easy. No. But you actually have them go through and watch them live, and they go, mind-blowing. Mm. Mind-blowing. Do we live in a simulation? <laughs> kind of like, uh, was it? Uh, the Matrix. The Matrix. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think so. There's a lot of talk so. about the Matrix at the moment and Andrew Tate under threat from, you know, whatever powers. Do we live in a simulation? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have enough evidence to go that route. Uh, I can't prove it. I can't prove it. Dis I can't prove or disprove it. Mm. I mean, you know, you've got metaphors that people use that, you know, looking at the cosmos and the cosmic web, oh, it looks like a brain, it's similar to the brain, are we sitting inside a giant brain? Uh, you know, these kind of questions. They're speculations. Mm. I don't know if they're positive or negative speculations, they're, they're both. Mm. They're, it's creative, it's neat thinking, but I, I can't say that that's my, my conclusion at mm. this point. Is it not true, though, that we have a very <laughs> narrow perception in terms of we put meanings on things based on our own very limited and restricted knowledge and you know for example our vision only sees a very small bandwidth of what is there to see is that not true yeah mm. each of our senses are very finite the phenomenological world through the senses is very finite no one would debate that i mean the visible spectrum compared to uh, microwaves, uh, you know, short la wavelengths and long wavelengths of infrared and, and all the way into the radio spectrum and then ultraviolet and x-ray and gamma and really high gamma and who knows what's beyond that. Um, we are a sliver mm. of our visual senses. We've got birds that can go up into ultraviolet and you've got snakes that can go down in the infrared but we pretty well and we have some responses to that, uh, chromophobes that basically respond to that but we have a very finite uh, domain that we function in but we definitely you know that's our reality mm. if we go too high we need a we need a uh, a space suit if we go too low we need a diving suit and we'll implode or explode so we have a very finite plane uh in the terrestrial sphere that we can live without having specialized equipment to to go above or below mm. and a very narrow range which is for our survival here on the planet yeah. terrestrial survival there's a lot of talk right now out there 
about alien life. Um, what are your thoughts on if there is alien life out there in the universe or the multiverse? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know it's a bit random. Isn't it? Well, I, I studied uh, exobiology. And I, in 1986, seven, I tried to be a special missions astronaut for NASA. I failed some of the tests, couldn't follow authority. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my objective was to go in, on special mission to go and study biology in space, see if we could find microorganisms. I believe from what we can tell in the study of extremophiles, that extreme acid, extreme base, extreme uh, radiation, extreme gravitation, extreme hot temperature, cold temperature. Th we have the capacity to have microorganisms that live in very extreme conditions. And um, halophiles, which are certain portions of the periodic table they can live in. So I believe that there's life out there uh, in microorganisms right now. I can't say that eukaryotic cells, which are complex cells, those are prokaryotes, Eukaryotic cells that have uh, nuclei and have a DNA and have true nuclei, nuclear membranes, and nuclear pores, and nu nuclear structures that are more complex structures. I can't guarantee that we'll find those in, uh, in the environment, but I think prokaryotics are going to be found probably before I even pass on mm. the next decade. So that means that there's life out there, and that means it's off the Earth, we know that if we go all the way out to the space station, we have tardigrades and bacteria that live there. We know when we go up to 40,000 feet, we get bacteria floating on dust grains. We know down in the, the Antarctica, down in very depths, we have lithophiles and halophiles that are very extreme conditions. And we know that we, everywhere we look, we find bacteria. So, and we know that they can also be microorganisms or parasitic organisms that are obligate inter intracellular parasites that can live in even more extreme conditions. So they're DNA or RNA based. We could say that's life. We could say that that's probable. So we also know that meteorites could, the dust grains and meteorites could store these little crevices, these little lithophiles and extremophiles. So I'm a firm believer that there's, we're going to find microorganisms. That's probably in this solar system and some of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, we're probably going to come from, maybe even on Mars or the, the, the moon. Mm. So biology's out there, exobiology, exo means exiting from the earth, is out there. I believe that's there. Mm. I think there's very, very strong evidence to support that. We also have plenty of evidence that there's water-based planets out there. There's some that look almost like the earth. So the probability and possibility of those being out there in at least microorganisms is very high. Mm. Now, has there been an advanced civilization visiting us and and um, running around and doing UFO stuff. I haven't seen sufficient evidence for me to be satisfied. And I see all the stuff that's out there right now. And there's tons of it hitting the market right now. Um, but I haven't seen anything that goes, now it doesn't mean it's not there. I just haven't seen it. So mm. I'm not, right now, if you ask me if there's been aliens on the planet that are advanced civilizations coming and visiting, I'd say I have no evidence of it. Mm. It'd be great, but. I'm a little leery about it because if they did come and they were, were advanced, most advanced civilizations wipe out less advanced civilizations and they wouldn't probably be running around in little fancy little UFOs or anal probing people out in the middle of a field somewhere. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I was hoping to get anal probed myself out there one time. I've been <laughs> over and looked in there and my aliens passed me by, I guess, <laughs> jokingly. I, I had a guy t try to tell me that he had had that and I was just going, that's bizarre. But... Um, so I'm not a, I, I'm not seeing, I'm, I mean, I've seen a lot of the stuff that's out there right now for, I mean, I'm, I've been interested in this since my 20s. Mm. <laughs> I'm almost 70 now. Yeah. So 50 years I've been exploring this. Yeah. But the evidence that I've seen is, is mm. flimsy. So if, Most if, of it. if space and time are infinite, is it not possible that, you know, <laughs> hundreds of millions of years ago there was previous species and in hundreds of millions of years, there will be more. Well, we can speculate, and that's great. I mean, we can make futuristic predictions of that, but it's one thing to speculate with fantasy, another one to speculate with some data. Mm, well, of course, we found dinosaurs, didn't we, before that, and we can see the duration of how long we last, what, I don't know how long the sun's got left. 
five billion years, something like that. When that goes, we're all gone, aren't we? If not before, if we don't wipe ourselves out with AI or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic now. I think that we'll work with AI and we'll figure out how to keep going. But don't you, th I, don't you think we are f far less intelligent than we think we are? Yes, yes. Yeah. But we also have capacities that we don't know we have yet, that AI will help us wake up. Because yeah, we could have just created the end as we know it, though, with AI, couldn't we? Could. Uh, you talked about we, we, superior whenever and I, inferior Whenever species. I see gloom and doom or boom and zoom, I usually see dialectics of opposite viewpoints. Mm. And I try to study both. Mm. Because if I take one side and I see, oh, we're at the end of the world, that's, that's not the whole picture. Nah. There's plenty of evidence to show the other direction, too. Yeah. So I'm, I'm leery about highly sensational, polarized individuals saying that, you know, AI is going to destroy this or AI is going to save this. Or mm. I, I don't pay attention to that. I, I try to use the dialectic and, and try to look for the proposition and the opposite proposition and try to find that it's, it's going to have a balance of both. It'll be benefits and drawbacks like every other technology we've ever yeah. had. Our technology of a computer has got advantages. And social media. Social media has yeah. advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. So how do you use Living it? Living longer has got advantages and disadvantages. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the, I mean, we, we have uh, the vertical gene transmission from living long has got de detriments on adapting. So we need to have lateral gene transfer to compensate for vertical. Mm. And uh, so if and we live too long, what's not to our advantage? Yeah, and the effect on the economy that living longer has and on the resources on the planet. And population right now. We need to, we need to be working on the population, not getting rid of the population. Yeah. Right now it's on a decline. So we, we're, we're, we're having mm. to be aware of them. In the next 40 years, we're going to have a really strong transformation going on where people are going to want to have some kids. Yeah. Because it will be an economic uh, effect. Mm. But I'm not a... I, I wish I could say, I, I worked with a guy named Nick Nicodemus, who is with Lockheed, who's the one that helped me get through the red tape at NASA. Um, and he had spent most of his life since he was a very young boy on the study of UFOs and aliens and things like that. Very bright guy. And he's got every book that you've ever seen has come out on that. He's been through it and read it and stuff. And, and I, I haven't seen anything. Now I've seen the documents from Roswell and I've seen all the, I've seen videos and I've seen this guy recently announced that he's, that they're hiding aliens things. I haven't seen it. I've heard some guy claim it, but I haven't seen anything yet. So yeah. when I see it, I may change my mind. But yeah. right now I haven't seen anything that satisfies me that we have aliens. Yeah. I've seen Egyptian hieroglyphs perceived as aliens and I've studied hieroglyphics and know that that's not what it is but that's what people want to make up make make it into their minds mm. there's other explanations mm. in in uh, the study of hieroglyphics to explain that yeah. so most of the stuff I find has very weak mm. so but does that mean it's not possible I keep my own, my mind open just in case mm. if something is if somebody shows me an evidence of it and we got something and we see technologies and we see it but my experience is uh, of an advanced individual who could travel across the world wouldn't crash. The guy was saying the other day, he says it crashed. If it traveled all the way across the galaxy to get you from another thing. I mean, we've got Voyager. Voyager 1 and 2 have left, right, since the 70s. And they're outside the solar system. They're extrasolar right now. And somebody asked the other day, you know, how far has it traveled? And it's going to take thousands of years to get to the first light year. And some of these are 26,000 light years away to the center of the galaxy. So we haven't even got to, I believe that when we, if we are able to travel at incredible speeds centuries into the future, we might come across something that might be considered another advanced civilization. But I, I don't see any evidence yet. Mm. I remember you saying to me once that the universe won't throw you a challenge you can't handle. And it really got me thinking, why do people commit suicide then? Most of the people I see that are suicidal, they, I, I worked with a gentleman just the other day that wanted to commit suicide, and he tried three times, and we broke his fantasy. He had an unrealistic expectation about how his parents were supposed to be, unrealistic expectation how society was supposed to be, unrealistic expectation about what he was supposed to accomplish without a strategy. Anytime you try to set a goal that is not in line with your values or project expectations on people that aren't in line with their mm -hmm. highest values, or expect one-sided outcomes, or a combination of the two, or expect a goal that doesn't have a strategy to get there, you're gonna end up being depressed. And you could take your life, because then if you've been indoctrinated, particularly by religious instructions, that there's a better life in the afterlife, which has no proof, 
Um, you may think, well, I'll just go ahead and end it here and go to this, this afterlife and hang out with some virgins or something. And if you believe that, <laughs> if, you've been, if you've been indoctrinated that way, then you might go and run off and mm. do that. But that would be a bit speculative. Mm. I remember Charlie Munger, he was interviewed and he said, what's the secret to happiness? And he said, low expectations. Exactly. Stop expecting. It's so that's, that, a, that's an ancient thing. He studied a lot of the ancient classics. Very stoic, isn't it? Yeah, it's stoic. It, so is that like the, um, essentially, because, for example, people ask me a lot about raising kids, and I don't perceive myself as, a, as an expert, but I feel like if my kids know what the world is really like, not overly down about it or overly up about it they really you know they're in reality not fantasy surely that's not is that not a great way to live a relatively happy life I, i'd rather call it a fulfilled life yeah why, why don't you like the term happiness because i think most people think of it in terms of hedonistic immediate gratification and you know a consumer world of you know buying things for immediate gratification that are depreciables i think that that's not they fill up a house. I mean, you, you know, I tell people, you go buy a house, they pay a million dollars for a house, and a quarter of it is storage space. <laughs> they put in there stuff that depreciates and consumables, and they spend their life paying off that. Mortgage means a pledge unto death. Mm. So you're basically paying a mortgage all the way till you die to fill up a space with stuff that you don't ever use. It's going down in value because you bought into the idea of comparing yourself to the Joneses and think you need to live through other people's brands to vicar vicariously in order to feel better about yourself. And to me, that's delusional. I think that people can have deep meaning and have eudaimonia, as, as Aristotle would describe it, fulfillment and well-being by having realistic expectations that are congruent with what you value, that have real strategies, that are balanced, and being fully aware that you're going to have both pleasures and pains in the pursuit of it. Mm. Yeah, because I remember you saying to me in the back of a Range Rover this was years ago, you were meditating or something, and you just turned to me like this and went, and you said, Rob, I gave up happiness years ago because it made me so damn depressed. And I had this sort of like, da, 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 da. Yeah. Like, I couldn't really wrap well, my brain I, around that. I wrote this little book. I never published it. I gave up happiness. It made me too sad. The joy of depression. It was a funny joke. <laughs> yeah. It's like my other book that's 66, no, 666 questions to ask your favorite fundamentalist from you know who from down under. <laughs> it's another little comical book. But yeah, I, at age 30, I did a two-year study from age 28 to 30 about the idea of trying to be positive all the time and mm. up all the time. Yeah, this happy, clappy, positive movement. Yeah, yeah. And that, that to me is one of the biggest opium sales on the planet. Right. And so I don't promote it. I debunk it because it's not going to bring you fulfillment. No. It's trying to make things one-sided. Yeah. I yeah. did a... I just published four books this year. And uh, one of them is on the resilient mind. And the other one is on emotional intelligence, the essentials of emotional intelligence. And I address that very issue, the illusions of pursuing one-sided happiness. Mm. The saddest people I know are the people wanting a one-sided wow. world. Comedians are often very depressed, aren't they? I mentioned that because yeah. comedians are very tom commonly covering up their tragedies yeah. with their comedies. So um, if happiness isn't happiness and if happiness is hedonistic, what is happiness? I don't use the word. I use fulfillment, filling full the mind. But you see, when you infatuate with somebody and you're too humble or resentful of something and too proud and you disown parts, you have emptiness and fulfillment is filling full those by loving people again. When you have a, an objective view and you see things from balance and you don't put them down or up and you put them in your heart and you love somebody and you appreciate it, you have fulfillment. Love is fulfilling, judging is emptying. So it's fulfilling. Fulfillment is what I call it. Fulfill the mind. You have a, if you exaggerate yourself, uh, if you if you're, if minimize yourself, you fill it. If you are exaggerating yourself, you fill it. If you put them together, you get the fulfillment. I put them in together. Take your pride, take your shame, put them together in the same game. Liberate yourself from the illusions of false attributions. And Epictetus said, if you blame people, initially and in you're first on your journey, you blame other people, then you blame yourself, and then you realize there's nothing to blame. I'd rather get to a point where there's no blame or no credit. Just take no credit, take no blame. Just keep focused on chief fame. The name of the game is thank you, I love you. Right. And is that the same with forgiveness? Forgiveness if, 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 assumes, forgiveness is a self-righteous assumption that they've done something to you that has a drawback without a benefit, which is not true. And that what they've done is something that they've done that you haven't done, which is not true. And that if they had done what you fantasize, life would have been happier, which is not true. 
So I don't promote forgiveness and apologies. I find them unproductive. I find that people that forgive people usually attract it over and over again. And the people that say, I'm sorry, I keep doing it again. The classical example is the husband that comes home late. I'm sorry, I'm home, I'm late, honey. Okay, I forgive you. Well, next week he's gonna do it again and she's gonna do it again and it's just redundancy. So I don't waste my time on that. I'd rather go in there and, and help them realize that the reason he's staying there is because he doesn't want to go home without a clear mind and wants to make sure he's completed his business, most likely, or when he comes home, or uh, he, when he gets home, he's getting bitched at and he's unconsciously trying to avoid coming home because you're being self-righteous about he's supposed to live in your values. And so if he's minimizing himself with apologies, he's trying to live in your values, which is futile. And you're going and saying, I forgive you, is you're trying to get him to live in your values, which is futile. And that's not, a, that's not the dynamic of a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship is learning how to communicate what you value in terms of their values, so it's their decision and their values why they're coming home. That's a smart spouse. Mm. They're not doing it because they need to do it to please you. They're doing it because they're getting enough benefits out of being there. You give them enough appreciation for, for the work, and you, um, you know, give them enough reasons in your values, in his values, for doing what you want, they'll do it because they're getting their values met. Mm. So I've studied this and you for a long, long time. As you know, you're one of my great mentors. Um, and sometimes it, I, f I find that the more you know, the more of a curse it can be. Because, you know, when you're blissfully, naively unaware of the projections and the judgments, you, you see, like you said, life in black and white. But, you know, sometimes I'll do something and I'll feel really good about myself. And then I'll be like, oh, I better not feel too good about myself. That's puffing myself up and I'm feeling proud. Um, and so then, you know, sometimes I feel like I suppress my own enjoyment of life. And you know, I don't want to flex too much. I remember you said to me once, um, there's flexing and there's facts and facts are facts. Yeah, but you, you do content on social media. I did a video, it's gone pretty viral recently and a lot of people are judging me. Oh, you've got a chip on your shoulder, you talk about his cars and material items and you know, money isn't everything. And, uh, you're not as real as this other guy. And uh, I'm like, does this make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah, anytime you allow yourself to get elated with yourself, you're going to attract people that criticize you mm. and get you back in equilibrium. Mm. So you can either do it to... So if you do, if it, you don't to do your, it to yourself, the world around you has, yeah, will yeah, do yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the... Whenever I work with celebrities, I always tell them, if you want the tabloids to back off, whatever they say, say to yourself and bring yourself back off, off Jupiter. Because mm. you got yourself up, puffed up. Mm. And they're, they're doing their job. Does that not sort of hinder the enjoyment of life no though. no no because do you mind if i play with your brain please yeah yeah play away yeah <laughs> okay go to, anyway, go to so. a moment when you actually felt you were proud of something i'm proud of proud of puffed up oh so not proud as in happy proud as in proud of, i've done something that I yeah thought, i've got a lot of cars and so check me out i've bought a lot of cars yeah but but pride is an assumption that you did something with your motor actions that actually contributed more benefits and drawbacks to somebody that's pride. Mm. So go to a moment you did something you felt proud of. Um, maybe when I've raised a lot of money for charity for the... Okay, go the, to a moment you felt yeah. kind of puffed up like I did that. Yeah. And you have a false attribution bias about how you did this for all those people. Right. Okay. Yeah. Me, go to that moment. Yeah, I'm there. Okay, close your eyes and go there. Yeah. At that exact moment, where are you? I'm standing on stage with a big check in my hand for £125,000 and the Guinness Book of World Records guy is there with the um, certificate and you know, everyone's like, woo! Okay. So 47 go, and a half hours. Good, good. Go do that. Go that moment. Yeah, I'm there. Good. At that exact moment, you're proud of what you did. Yeah. And you made a statement publicly? Yeah. 47 good. and a half hours worth of statements. Yeah. Okay, so go that moment. But no, I, this has to be a moment. This can't be four hours. Yeah. This okay. is a moment when you're yep. feeling proud. Yeah. Because you didn't feel proud during the whole, all the four hours. No, I felt fucked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of work. Yeah. So go to that moment. You felt yep. proud. Yeah. Okay. Where are you shamed at that moment? Where am I shamed at that moment? Yeah. Where, at, where are you? Where am I feeling shame? Where are you feeling I left somebody out, I didn't include somebody, I didn't acknowledge, I, didn't, I wasn't there for my family? or what, where, where is the other side at that moment? Yeah, I mean, I have worked a lot over the years and I, has, I have felt guilt about not being around my wife yeah, too but much. I don't, uh, that's, that's over the years. I'm talking about this moment. At that moment, when you're being proud, where's the shame? That moment, when you're standing on stage. I don't know. No, no, I don't know as you stop looking. Look again. 
Get present in that moment. Yeah. Get present in that moment. When you're on the high and you feel proud, and you think you did a major contribution, where did you feel you let somebody down? I mean, yeah, maybe when the, well, when the announcer. Okay, as he's announcing it. Yeah. And you haven't got the check yet, but they're coming up and announcing it. Yeah. Go to that moment. Yeah. Because if you're not at the moment, your brain won't do it. Mm. Now, at that moment, what he's, he's saying, and then what's the part you're feeling ashamed of or minimizing yourself about? Um, the quality of the, the things I've said over the 47 hours. So that was in your mind? Yeah. Because you cannot build yourself up without beating yourself up. Not possible. Right. That's the licensing effect. Yeah. So you don't have to wait. When somebody says, well, I'm, I'm now puffed up and I'm waiting for what's about to happen. I don't want to get too elated. It's already happening. Mm. The other side's simultaneously going. As you go up, the other one's going down to balance it. Yeah. Now, if you're not aware of it, you're going to be anxious about this one coming because you're going to be addicted to this and want to be subjected from mm. this. You're going to be frightened of losing this and fear of gaining this. And that's not because you're not, you're not present in that moment. Yeah. We're seeing both occur. If you see both of them, go back to that moment now and you, when you're feeling the pride, what was the thing you said that you, the, how you spoke? Yeah. If in the, order to make that deal? Yeah. To close it? Yeah. You said some bullshit you didn't want to, to say? Yeah, or, or, or just worrying that people would get good value out of what I was teaching them and they're spending 47 and a half hours with me. And, so you're questioning it yeah, and doubting it. Yeah. And, and devaluing some of the things you said, God, I would try to, if I could say it over, yeah. I would say this. Yeah. Can you see your brain was doing that? Yeah. Now go back to that moment and get the thing and see where that is and see if you can't get them to simultaneously. If there comes simultaneously, a tear of gratitude will come out of your eye. Mm. Do it again. Right. And think of the people. Mm. And what about the unconscious motives of why you're really doing it? Yeah. Um, so why I'm really doing it is balanced between doing good and... There's always an altruistic and narcissistic Yeah, side. exactly. Um, it's, I always say there's, you're compensating for shame and guilt of the past or you have a hidden agenda of the future. Both are always present when you're doing something you've labeled positive, mm, you know, praise. Yeah. Can you see their surface now? When yeah. You're there? Okay, if you become present, they're simultaneous. You don't have a fear, it's already happening, and you already got the compensation, and it humbles you, and you get authentic, and you get grateful for the opportunity to be of service to people. Mm. And that's where the power is. Yeah. Mm. Free therapy session here, John. Well, because <laughs> cause if you think you, the idea that you assumed you got a positive, and then the negative is gonna come, is an assumption that they're separated. Right. They're not. No. They're simultaneous. Yeah. But one's conscious, the other's unconscious. If, I, if you come really present, the intuition will bring out the unconscious. And then you go, hmm. And then all of a sudden this pride dissolves. Mm. Right now, when you think about that pride right now, what happens? It has a different feeling, doesn't it? Yeah. Because you're going, hmm, it wasn't really something to be proud of or ashamed of. It's just an event. Yeah. Another thing in my life. Mm. You also have to, to, to know when you're giving money to people, what they do with it, does not always lead to the result we sometimes anticipate and mm. hope. Yeah. Giving up, as, as, as one of the big philanthropists that uh, lives on the ship made a statement to me, he says, I spend more hours trying to know how to give away money than I ever did making it. Yeah. To make sure that I don't destroy people with entitlements uh, and rob them of dignity, accountability, responsibility, productivity, and things. Mm. And to make sure that the people involved are using it wisely in the way that they had done and put checks and balances in to make sure it's really being used wisely. Yeah. And that's the accountability that comes with that. Because mm. we sometimes will, I remember this one lady was all proud of herself because she was raising money to feed kids in Africa. And I said, so let's just take a look at what you're doing. Oh, give me a sample of somebody you fed in Africa. Well, this young girl, she was nine, she had no parents, they died of AIDS and you fed her. Okay, so now what's happened? Well, she's now 13, so well, she has a child. <laughs> and another one I did, she was nine, and by the time she was 15, she had three kids. 
I said, so are you feeding them and they're making them dependent or are you educating them and making them stand on their own two feet? She goes, that's a good point. I'm just feeding people, making children and may, having more children to have to feed because they have no education. They can't make, they can't make a living and they can't take care of their kids. Mm. I said, so is that something to be proud of or is that something to be ashamed of or is that something that's just got both? Mm. And she says, wow, I never thought about that. I need to put some education in there to decrease the probability of them being dependent. Mm. So she changed her philanthropy to put education and food. Mm. We do a quick fire round on the show. Okay. Um, would you rather have one million pounds cash right there or one million engaged followers on social media and why? What social media? Which one? Whichever platform you choose where you feel you get the best reach and engagement. If, if I could share a message with 1,000, you said 1,000 or 1, 1 million? million? If yeah. I could share a message in, on a consistent basis to impact a million people's lives, uh, that's worth more than a million dollars easily. Mm. Way more. Can money buy happiness? Uh, it can give you transient moments because of the opportunities it provides. You get transient moments of, of uh, satisfaction, but it doesn't guarantee you fulfillment because you and I both know people that are extremely wealthy that are unfulfilled. Mm. I, I sat right here in this hotel. No, no, pardon me, a different hotel here in London um, with a gentleman who was 43 years old whose father gave up on him and gave him three billion dollars to go away. Wow. Three billion dollars, one of your wealthiest people in your country. Mm. The son was, is a lost cause. The father just said, forget it. Take three billion, get out of my life, disappear. And he was angry. He came to me for consult to figure out how to get the rest of the money from the father. Right. And he was doing drugs and coke and parties and buying people's friendships and everything else with tons of money and was a very angry, childish, ridiculous child. And I told him, I said, you want to know my advice? Take your money, give it back to your father, go to the company, start from the bottom job, work at least a few months under every job in that company and work your way up the company and actually go to manual labor and do all the different things and learn how to manage and everything else. And when your father sees you're an accountable young man, he'll probably give you the company. Mm. But you being angry at him because you're an incompetent individual, I think your father's gave up on you. He, he, the way he managed you led you to this, and the way you've managed your life has led you to this. this is, you, you've trapped yourself. Mm. But that's my advice. Go back to your father, says, here's, take some money, give me the job, let me prove myself. And in a matter of five years or 10 years, you will probably be one of the wealthiest and smarter people on the planet. He says, I'm paying you money for this, this advice? I said, yes, and I've already deposited it. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked out and he was, he was a child, mm. a, a little spoiled little brat. Mm. And I said, that's, that's, so sometimes money, if it's not, giving money without motive and reason and, and accountabilities and responsibilities can destroy people. Yeah, and then the understanding of how to use it properly. Yeah. Yeah. He was squandering it. Rags yeah. to riches to rags. Yeah. Very common thing. Mm. Is ego the enemy? No. Uh, it depends on the language and who you're writing about. When Freud called the ego the I or the self. And the I or the self is, is, the true ego is different than the false ego. The false ego is what's confused much literature about get rid of your ego. That's the false ego, which is the pride side, which is an exaggeration, inauthentic expression when you assume that you've done something that's got benefits without drawbacks, or you're assuming you've done something you're proud of without the shame. The true ego is that center point where you're actually yourself and the true I and that's not something you're going to get rid of. That's something you're going to appreciate and learn how to use wisely for contribution on the planet. Mm. The false ego is the one that people get trapped on. And sometimes those languages have been confused, primarily because when you puff yourself up with pride, you expand. But when you're living in your true ego, your true self, you tend to also expand doing something meaningful that's productive, that's, that serves people. Mm. And that expansion got crisscrossed in the literature many years ago and people have confused the two. There is a false and a true ego, and the false ego is the one that most people are saying you want to govern. Mm. And the true ego is something you want to allow yourself to be. Now you could go into this idea that, well, you know, the real you is some abstract universal thing, and there's one mind out there, and, and the, the individuality of that is your illusion. Well, and that type of enlightenment idea is great, but you're going to have to extinct the individuality in the process and not too many people are willing to extinct themselves. <laughs> mm. So it's a neat idealism, but I don't think that's productive. Mm. 
Um, should you mix family and business? It depends on the family's values. It depends on what the business is. Depends on how engaged people are and depends on how they're allocated jobs within the business. If it's done really well and they're allocated where they're getting their values met uh, and they're doing something that there's a great cause in the business, it could be amazing things for a family. Mm. It could also be the undermining and destruction of a family if it's, if it's not done that way. Mm. Is your daughter still working in the yeah. business? Yeah. She just got married uh, Sunday. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. yeah, it's great. I got to walk her down the aisle. Mm. Great thing for a dad. Um, is it true your um, wife passed away and it meant many years ago? Yeah, 19 years and six, seven months. And, and how did you emotionally deal with that? Well, I found out about it in October that she had cancer and she died in December, so two months. Wow. And it, was, it had metastasized into her bones and different uh, organs, so it was quick. So the second I found out about it, because I have a, a, a grief process that I developed over the years, I started using it, applied what I've learned. And um, so I did 139 different behavioral traits that I watched grow, go down and decline as she was coming close to the death process. And as it was occurring, I was doing this process uh, where what is the specific trait that I admire about her? Um, at the moment, she's, at, at the, from the moment I'm seeing it decline, who's picking it up and identify the transformation where it is and uh, until the quantity is equal. And then what's the drawback of the traits? So I break the infatuation with any of the traits. And what's the benefit of the new people? And I just used the transitions. So when she actually passed, it was pretty clear. So I didn't have any grief or, you know, any major emotional responses. I just had a presence and a love for my wife. Mm. I only found about three years later, I was on, a, on the ship and I was having dinner with somebody who knew her and up came one little behavioral trait that I still admired and, and missed. I had a reaction. I got a piece of paper out and did it right there on the spot at the dinner table and cleared it. Mm. So... I've been working on grief since 1976 uh, when I, well, actually that's true. In, in 1968, I noticed that when I was a hitchhiking kid out in California and, and that I ended up meeting this girl that was older that took me in who was like a mother and a lover. She washed my clothes and cooked for me and everything else, but also made love with me. And then also I, I, she had a son who was four who was taken by a husband she'd had who was, came from a wealthy family, and even though she was older than him, he, the family took the, the child because she didn't have an income. And so she was missing a four-year-old child, and her husband was 24, and she was 27. If you put their ages together, it was 28 plus, and I was 14 and a quarter or so, half. So I was partly the son and partly the husband, and she was partly the mother and partly the girlfriend. And I noticed on the streets when I was living as a street kid that I never missed a family member. It was just changing form and morphing. And I, I remember that since age 14. So that helped me understand what to do with grief. Whenever some trait appears to be missing, who's bringing it on? I always tell people at the level of the soul, nothing's missing. At the level of the senses, things appear to be missing. And that's because we infatuate one form and resent another form, and therefore we think there's something missing. So I, I did the process on her, neutralized it, transitioned it, except for that one trait that was three years later. And then when I got interviewed, four days after she died, I got interviewed by Women's Weekly, and the lady who was interviewing was in fatch with her and was grieving the loss. And so I did the process with her so she could finish the, the uh, interview because she was having difficulty doing the interview, and I helped her through it. So she wrote in the article, Dr. Martini helped me through my grief. <laughs> So he didn't seem to be grieving. And I mm. said, I don't know. When you really love somebody, you're, you're present with them. You feel grateful for them. You, you're as if they're present. But if you're in fact with them, you're going to fear their, you f grieve their loss. If you resent them, you're going to relieve their loss. But if you love them, you're going to feel their presence. Mm. So I've, I've developed a whole method for that and been using it since 1976 and clinically since 1984. Wow. Um, what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? And none of this, there are no mistakes. Jeez. Well, I don't, that's not how I perceive it. I don't <laughs> perceive mistakes. I look back at my life and I go, this is the lesson I got. So I don't mm. know if I have a mistake construct. No. I always say the only time you think you make a mistake is when you compare your actions to somebody else's values. If you look at the time you made a mistake, it's because you compared your action to somebody else's values. Because in your values, it's not a mistake. In somebody else's values, it looks like a mistake. When somebody, it, it, Drucker said this, you hire somebody and they didn't do the job. They, they didn't do it the way you wanted it and they made a mistake. But you hired them 
and you didn't screen them on what their values are to make sure there's congruency uh, and that they can, there's a high degree of congruency between their job and engagement. And so they, they're just living in their values and you expect them to live in yours and therefore you project onto them the idea that they didn't do what you expected, but that's because you expected them to live in your values. Mm. And they're living in their own. Yeah. So we only make a mistake when we are comparing our actions to somebody else's values that we're subordinating to or living in the duties of. So I, I don't see that as my, in my life. I don't look back and go, oh, I made a mistake here. I did this. I wish mm. I'd have done that. I don't, that's not how so I So no regrets either? I don't look at that, no. No. I, anything that I ever discovered that I thought, oh, I should have done that, I go and find out how did it serve these people and how did it serve them and neutralize it all out and clear it. I don't waste my time on running around with this idea that regret. I don't find that productive. Mm. What's the most brutal life lesson you've ever had? Brutal life lesson? Mm. That's a good question. I don't know if I have a brutal life lesson. I just, I think that everything that's going on in our life is just a feedback mechanism to try to make sure we're authentic. Mm. And that's the, the lesson for life, that every event that's going on is trying to get us back to that. Our physiology is creating that, our psychology is creating that, our sociology is creating that, and the tragedies and comedies in our life are all just feedback systems to get us back to authenticity. Mm. And so, is, is that with the body? Does your body even give you physical feedback as yeah. to oh, yeah. when you're out of balance? Absolutely. The, 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 the body with introception, there's extraception where you perceive things on the outside and introception, which is your physiology, giving you feedback, your blood pressure, your mm. equilibrium, your pH and all this internal feedback. Everything has a homeostatic mechanism to it. I mean, every transmitter, every modular, every signal molecule, every uh, neurohormone um, has a feedback in the hypothalamus to let it know what its ratios are to, to try to get things back into balance. So everything is a homeostatic mechanism uh, from the perturbation perceptions that we go through life that we've picked up by our indoctrination of, of indoctrination of, of, you know, ideals that people promote. Mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, tradition, conventions, and mores about how it should be. And all those, we have to break through those. It was um, Kohlberg that said that, you know, you start out with a punishment rewarding mentality you then go to subordinating to mothers, fathers, preachers, and teachers in a pre-conventional aspect of moral development, then a conventional level where you're indoctrinated and you're becoming indoctrinated in tradition, and then you finally go, you know what, screw that. I, I, I want to be an individual. I don't want to be subordinate and be part of the crowd. I want to be individual and make a difference in the world. I can't make a difference fitting in. I got to stand out. Until eventually you transcend the moralities and you live by universal laws that are unviolatable instead of human laws which are inevitably violatable and the moral hypocrisies. So I don't waste my time on, on the moral hypocrisy. I find them, they're, they're delusions. Mm. Someone said to me, there's no such thing as a virus. Um, and that um, ailments within the body, so for example, he had lung cancer. And he said he, there was some stressing that he was holding on to, some imbalanced perception. And as soon as he let go of that, the lung cancer disappeared. Would you agree with that statement? Would I agree that that can occur? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely spontaneous remissions of various types of illnesses and sometimes psychological um, awarenesses can change the autonomic r responses. Cancer I define as a last ditch effort of our physiology to try to wake us up to where we've been Re unresilient, unadaptable, rigid in our views about good and bad or right or wrong or something that we're holding on to that's making us not adaptable. And it's regressing us back to primitive gene wow. toolkits that are being activated that are stored in our so non-coding so DNA regions. So it's an evolution. It's an, there's an, a, a reverse evolutionary process activated. Which the body manifests The body manifests under distress. As, as feedback. The earliest cells on the planet, as I mentioned earlier, were extremophiles. And extremophiles live under extreme acid or base. And if you get it, a high sympathetic, you get acid. And if you get a high parasympathetic, you get base. And so when we're under high distress and we're perceiving subjective bias interpretations, like my mom was always mean to me and never nice to me, and I would never do that, and always nevers, you were regressing to a primitive non-resilient, non-adaptable state. It's the lady that, was, that was, I started with, a story about you know, absolute evil, 
if she's around him, she has a major fear to be around that individual if she has that perception. When she finished, she hugged the guy. There was no fear because we brought it back into balance. So a perfectly balanced mind does not have the fear of loss or the fear of gain. It has just the presence. That's why you don't have grief if you're present and if you balance. You have grief. You, you grieve the loss of that which you infatuate with. You grieve the gain of that which you resent. And you relieve the loss of that which you resent. And you relieve the gain of that which you are infatuated with. But if you balance things out and you're neither one, you just feel the presence of somebody. There's no perception of gain and loss. And here you have healing and wellness quotient, high wellness quotient, because the autonomics, the heart rate variability of the autonomics go into balance, and we have the heart rate variability, which is our ability to res have resilience and adaptability. It goes up and maximizes if the autonomics are perfectly balanced. And perfectly balanced perceptions bring balanced autonomics. But perfectly imbalanced perceptions, all, none, black, white, good, bad, right, wrong, moral hypocrisies that are not obtainable they make our brain and body go backwards and regress to very primitive embryological and phylogenetically uh, activated gene codes. And we can create viruses. Seven to 10%, 11% of our genome is viral genome. Another 8% is bacterial genome. We can reactivate it. Arnold Levine at the Princeton uh, University in his book called Virology back in the 80s uh, did a great job in showing that we could generate and manufacture viral elements and create viruses out of our own cells. We, we have the machinery to reverse the transcriptase and go and create the viral particles. So we can get an inf infection and they can then use our machinery to replicate or we can actually just generate them and oncogenes, cancer genes, are sometimes generated from cells that are remnants from very ancient viral genome billions of years ago, mm. still sitting in our genome. Hmm. Um, the future. What are you A, most excited about and B, most scared of? You're asking me for those two. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I'm not much of an excitement or anxiety that much. Um, don't know. Don't know if I'm super excited about something or super frightened about something. I, I see that whatever goes on in life, it has a pair of opposites. So take no credit, take no blame, don't get elated, don't get depressed, just keep focused. And, you know, I, I hear people, I heard a guy uh, speaking the other day that was talking about, you know, doomsday because of the uh, global warming and stuff like that. And I just go, I don't buy that. I, I see tremendous insights emerging almost every single day on the literature coming in with new ways of solving these problems. And I, I, they've had these same doomsday predictions in the past over food and, and you know, population and all kind of stuff. I, I don't find myself overly excited or overly depressed about those things. I mm. see myself going, okay, I take the ones that I can focus on. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, my area of, is human behavior, so I, I try to concentrate on what I'm able to do something about. I have control over my perception, decisions, and actions, and I try to concentrate on the highest priority perceptions, highest priority decisions, and highest priority actions that, that I can in a day. And I don't, I know I, I, it's th those things outside that it's not my area of expertise, so I'm not going to do anything about it, so I put my energy on that. Mm -hmm. um, so do you believe that things like laziness and um, procrastination can be good? I think those labels are false. I don't think they exist. Uh, the person that, I, I remember this person was saying that my son is lazy, all he does is sit in front of the TV all day long. And I said, okay, let me chat with him. And so, so when you're watching TV, what are you watching? He says, all the CSI and all these uh, crime, figuring out how to solve these crimes. And I said, just out of curiosity, is that something you really, you love that? And he goes, yeah. He says, is that something you thought about doing in your life? He says, yeah. My mom wants me to go to school to do this, but I don't want to, I just want to be involved in solving crimes. I said, so you can do that six hours a day? He says, I spend six hours a day in front of the TV studying crimes. I, and, and is your room filled with books on crime and, and you magazine on crime? He says, that's all I read. I said, so I went to the mother and I said, you projected a label on him according to your values that he's lazy, but he's spending six to eight hours a day studying crime, but you're not honoring and valuing what he's finding is interesting, and so you're labeling him. But he's not lazy in what he's up to. Mm. He's lazy in your values. I'm lazy, to the lady that has a high value on working out, she says, I'm lazy, I'm not working out. I could label her lazy for not going to the, the library. 
But those are just projections. So those labels, lazy, are just projections of people with a totally reverse set of values onto somebody instead of honoring the person's values because th what they value is what they value, what they're doing. Mm. And, you know, I, I had this guy say, well, you know, this, my brother is this really lazy guy. And I said, what does he do? And he said, well, he just watches TV all day long. And I said, I said, and what do you do? He says, well, I'm running a major business. So I'm working 16 hours a day and da, 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 da. And I said, well, you know, family dynamics are pairs of opposites. The more you have one extreme, the more the other one balances out to balance out the values in a family dynamic to make it work. So what he's basically doing is he's basically living off somebody else. He's figured out how to delegate it. They're doing work for him and he's <coughs> sitting and watching TV and doing what he does. And he knows everything about the, the shows that he's watching. He says, yeah. He says, well, to him, he's very disciplined. He's in front of that TV every single time at the same time, ready for the show. Yep. And he's focused and he can do that. Could you sit and watch TV? I'd, I'd go nuts watching TV like that. I said, well, he's able to do that just like you're able to do the work. And I, I made him re rephrase and reframe what he was doing and made him realize that in family dynamics, if you've got a brother and sister, you know that somebody's playing your opposite out there. Mm. And, and if you try to be proud of what your thing is and project it onto them, you don't realize that they're doing exactly what is needed for you to be there. Mm. And you better thank them for being the opposite. <laughs> mm. And when you do, you realize that they're not lazy in their values, they're lazy in your values, in your mind. And they're probably thinking you're lazy in their values. Yeah. So I don't... Uh, you know, I study every day and read every day, and I love learning, but I'm not right for that. Mm. Some people would think that's, you know, crazy. Some people say, well, you ought to be out socializing. You ought to be, you know, having a drink and relaxing. And I said, well, I'm relaxing in a book. Mm. So, but you would see me lazy when it comes to not socializing. They would, I would see them lazy not reading. Those are just labels. I don't like the, the term labels. No. In fact, I tell people in my programs, don't do the judgment on laziness because all it is is you expecting yourself to live outside your own highest values because if you're living in your in your highest values you're not lazy mm. in your very highest values which is probably learning educating and building business and wealth you're not lazy no but take something really low on your values is cooking important to you no okay do you get around to cooking never never no. just outsource it all yeah Every, I, anything in the house outsourced. see a, a wise individual in my opinion will outsource anything that's not highest on their values mm. and delegate it to specialists who are inspired to do it so they can have the greatest uh whatever that is by the greatest minds who are doing it mm. i haven't cooked since i was 24 i haven't driven a car in 33 years because i don't have a desire to, to do it mm. but somebody who absolutely has a high value on cars would think god he can't even drive a car he's what is he an idiot <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how it? to drive a car. It's been so long. I forgot it. Last time I did, I reached over and rolled up a window across yeah. the thing. <laughs> now it looks like some spacecraft. Yeah. I remember it parts itself. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's not my thing. I, I, I always sit in the back. They say, well, you can sit in the front. No, I want to sit in the back so I can get yeah. my computer out and I can research and write. Mm. I, I, on the way here today, I had a car service taking me from the ship to here. Yeah. And I stacked up a bunch of articles in there so I could summarize the articles in the back seat while they were, while he was driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would be lazy when it comes to driving and he would be lazy when it comes to, to studying. Yeah. So watch out for the labels. I, I think that's a waste of time throwing labels on people. Mm. I remember last time we were in this library and I asked you, what's one thing that's wrong with the world that you would like to change? And you looked at me in a very vacant, blank way and went, I don't understand. And I didn't understand that you didn't understand. What about that did you not understand? Is that because you think that everything is as it should be? I don't take the should, because the should is assuming that there's some authority that's designing that and it's right. anthropomorphic. And, and Okay. Yeah, I just, I'd prefer to just say that um, it, whatever I perceive that I think is an error is an incomplete awareness. Because once I go probing deeper into the mysteries of what it is, the more I come to a, a deep appreciation for the order that's there. Right. So anything that you perceive is wrong or has downsides has a hidden order of upside benefits. And vice versa. Yeah. So I, when I was 18 years old, um, I asked my mom, what exactly is a genius? And she said, well, people like Albert Einstein and Da Vinci. I said, well, get me everything you can on those guys. And I started to read one of three books on Einstein. He had a general relativity. He had um, the photoelectric effect. And he had Brownian movement, Brownian motion. So I read this book on Brownian motion and he took some little ditch water 
and he put it on a slide and, and he looked at it where there's a little bubble so you could see things moving around in there before it dehydrated. <clears throat> and he was, and he filtered out things until there's just one or two particles in there. And then he looked at the microscope and he was watching its movement. And when there was just one or two particles, there was a predictability to some of the movement, it was simple. If you had two particles, it was twice as complex. If you had three particles, it was six times as complex. If it had four particles, it's 24 times as complex. Five is 120 times complex. Six, 720 times complex. So there's a geometric progression of complexity as you add particles into the water and try to figure out the motion. And it reaches a point where the number becomes so, that's such a magnitude that we call it random. But he was thinking, what we think is random may be missing information. There's a hidden variable there. Well, that had a major impact on my thinking starting at age 18. From there, I read a book by Discourse on Metaphysics by, by Leibniz, Godfrey Wilhelm Leibniz. And in that book, he talked about uh, the idea that there was a perfection. Now, most people think of perfection, they think of kind without cruel, nice without mean. But the real perfection is the balance of opposites, the unity of opposites, as Heraclitus said. So he said that the few people ever get to really get to know that, but those that do, their lives are changed. And I, I got tears in my eyes when I read that, and I thought, wow. I want to find the hidden order in the apparent chaos and see if I can uncover some of the hidden variables. So I was 18 when I was doing that, and I wanted to know that. I then went on to what exactly is thermodynamics, because that led me to that. And I looked up a guy named Clausius, and Clausius was writing about thermodynamics and the laws of it, and entropy and enthalpy and, and the conservation law. And that led me to Ludwig Boltzmann, and Boltzmann said he was never satisfied with the statistics and mathematics of this uh, thing called randomness and disorder, he said there's hidden variables in there that we just don't know, and so it's, it's until we know that, we're just gonna use these models. And, but it's not a complete art, uh, thing of nature. Einstein said, I don't believe that, that life is playing dice with things, I think there's a hidden order in things. And David Bohm said there's an implicate order in things. So as I was going on my journey, I was never satisfied with the idea of the missing information. Claude Shannon in his information theory said that, that di disorder is missing information, order is the, you find the, all the information. And so I then went on a pursuit and realized and superimposed that onto the consciousness and said, when you're fully conscious, you see all the variables. When you're judging, you're seeing only part of the variables. If you extract meaning out of things and see both sides and balance out the equation, you get to see all the hidden variables. When you do, you get to see the order and there's a hidden order in the apparent chaos. So as a result of that, when things happen in the world, I'd rather I may not, I may react first, that's my amygdala, but I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna go back and probe that and dig deeper and find out the hidden variables. And I may spend 30, 40, 50 years working on it, but I wanted to know what the hidden variables of human behavior are. And I believe I've discovered some of them. And I believe that I've been able to help people break through these and beatings and tortures and all that stuff by helping them see things that they didn't see and refuse to see because they never thought to see because of the moral hypocrisies that they were indoctrinated in. But if I go and ask them the questions to make them see things they never even thought to ask and then see it just like the lady in the, you know, the, the conflict, all of a sudden they're going, there's nothing out of order. Mm -hmm. And they're thankful. Mm -hmm. Gratitude is a confirmation of seeing mindfully the hidden order in the apparent chaos. And the idea of impulses or instincts, seeking or avoiding, infatuating resentment or pride or shame is when you don't. Mm -hmm. And all those vicissitudes of emotion are byproducts of incomplete awareness. Mindfulness, enlightenment, satori, moksha, liberation, whatever the religious and philosophical and enlightened thinking was, is that awareness of both sides simultaneously. Mm. Where can we follow your work and what you do and where you are in the world and what events you have on and what books you're writing and all of that? The easiest way is just go to drdmartini.com there's a, we have a Demartini show, which is sort of like a podcast show that is a weekly thing that we're doing. But if you just go to drdemartini.com, that's probably the best place to go and find out what I'm up to. Mm. If you go to the media section, there's hundreds of radio, television, newspapers, magazines. I've written for 1,533 magazines around the world, so there's more than you're going to want to read. You're going to have to believe in reincarnation, just be able to come back to get it all read by the time you're done. Because <laughs> you're not going to be able to do it in one life, probably. But, um, you know, maybe your most popular event, is that the Breakthrough Experience? I've done it 1,184 times this week. 
Wow. This will be the 1,184 1, times. So yeah, I would say that that's the one I've done the most. Mm. It's been a pleasure as always, John. It's always great to see you and spend time with you. Yes, thank you for yeah. your great questions. Let me know what you think in the comments. The bigger we can grow this show for you, the bigger and better guests we can get. So make sure you do like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.